Welcome everyone, bienvenidos, bienvenidos everyone. Before we begin our event tonight, I want to remind all the attendees to please sign into the link provided in the chat by Nane. If you have any issues signing in, please make sure to direct message her. If you have any questions during the course of the presentation, please make sure to direct them to Jamie and we will address them at the conclusion of the presentation. Jamie will also have added questions to her name in case you want to identify her at a later point. At the end of the event, there will also be a short survey shared in the chat by Nane. So please make sure to take a couple of minutes to complete the survey before leaving our event tonight. We have ASL interpretation services by Carlos and closed captioning provided by Annabelle. You can enable closed captioning by selecting live transcript and enabling, enabling captions. Thank you for being here. Lastly, this is a reminder that this event will be recorded, so please adjust your settings to your preference. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to offer a land acknowledgement on behalf of the planning committee. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are currently occupying ancestral land of the Tongva people. In our work to promote social justice and education, we must always consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. With that being said, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's presentation for Latinx Heritage Month. This is Glendale Community College's second year observing Latinx Heritage Month. And our theme for this year is celebrating our diverse stories, voices, and identities. The planning committee selected this theme to celebrate the unique individuals within the Latinx community, despite the various challenges they have faced in this country. Lastly, it is an honor to introduce Sergio Gonzalez, who will be discussing the topic Latinx, Latino, Latin, Hispanic, and Queerness in Latinidad. Sergio A. Gonzalez is a PhD candidate in the School of Education Studies program at Claremont Graduate University. Sergio writes from the core of who he is. Joto, Latinx, feminist, hijo de first generation madre and Mexican immigrant padre, Joteria scholar and activist. As a scholar activist, he focuses on co-creating counter narratives of queer Latinx, Latina, Latino individuals within higher education. Currently, he is a research associate at the Center for Minority Serving Institutions and the Samuel Dewitt Proctor Institute for Leadership equity and social justice at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. His research interests focus on Joteria pedagogy, social justice, undocumented documented students, and queer Latinx students in higher education. With that being said, it is my pleasure to welcome Sergio Gonzalez. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for that. Um, buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches. I don't know where folks are at, but wherever you are, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I'm excited to be here and just share space and um, co-create. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to be like Latinx, Latino, Latina, Hispanic, and then how queerness ties into all of that, right? Because that goes into a lot of the stuff that I do. But also just to like come together and create some kind of community, right? Like, I think that's, that for me, that's the goal. That's how I work. That's how I like to be in, you know, in spaces with people. Um, so I'm, I have a bit of a presentation, but I don't want this to be like super formal. I don't engage in that way. I'm very much about the, oh, I have a question. All right, let's talk about it. If something grabs your attention, please feel free to, to chime in, ask a question. I might not see the chat box because I always get confused when I do the presentation mode, but I'll do my best to look for it. So if there's a question, please stop me. Um, so with that, I'm going to get us started. I'm going to share my screen. Awesome. And can folks see that? Okay, confirmation. Yeah, we're good. 
Awesome. Okay. So welcome again. I'm Sergio. My pronouns are el, he, him. I'm currently a PhD student. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about, or just be in comunidad and dive into what it means to be Latinx, Latino, Latine, Hispanic, and how queerness shows up in this notion of Latinidad, right? So I'm big on being a little organized because I'm really good about getting off tangent and going into this whole other conversation. So for us, for today, for this little agenda that I created, I'm gonna dive into a little bit about like who I am and my why, like why am I in this space? Because I think all of that is super important. So a bit of an introduction or as some would say, like a positionality right statement. Um, give a little historical context, right? About Hispanic and how it like you know, emerged, especially in the context of like being in the US, overview of some terminology, and then how it connects to the work that I'm doing. And then go like a quick summary, Q&A, and then if there's anything that folks wanna dive into um, with whatever time is remaining, I'm all about it. Cause I think the whole point is to engage in critical conversations and not to be like, oh, I don't believe in like the student professor vibe. I'm all about like, how are we in a space as equals and coming and bringing our knowledge, questions and curiosity. So. So anytime I do anything, whether I teach, whether I meet up with friends, whether I'm, you know, guest lecturing, I'm always trying to check in because a lot of times people are not asking how, you, how you're feeling. And so if anybody wants to shout out like how they're feeling or thinking about who are you, how you show up into this space, right? I also want you to think about, if you don't want to share, think of a place or a group that feels like home to you, where you can be yourself, feel validated, loved, where you can grow even through difficult moments and hurdles. And then as you continue to think and process or critically reflect, as I like to say, how does this connect to identity and to your identity, right? And I, I mean, I can start us off. So um, I feel good. I'm grateful to be alive, right? Um, it's been a long week and I'm like, every week feels like a long week because of this panorama. So I say panorama instead of, or I say any other P word except pandemic, because I'm at a point where I'm like, this is just funny that like, this is still going on. And it's like, ah, when will it end, right? Um, and so, so to me, I'm like, I'm, I'm set here on my hot mess and I'm in this panorama and I'm just trying to figure out life. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because especially in academia, we're taught and conditioned to be like, we're okay. Like everything's fine and it's not fine, right? Like things are happening, people are going through it. There's a lot of other things that are way more important and that needs to, that's real. So if anybody wants to share, whether it's in the chat or unmute their mic, like how are you feeling today? Anything good that you wanna share? Or write it in the chat box and I can like read it out. I'm also big on engaging as opposed to feeling great. Thank you so much. Yeah, like I'm, I'm not big on lecturing, so I don't want this to be like, oh, I'm in a class, I'm going to put the screen and I'm going to not really be there. <laughs> I want to be in conversation with folks. I made bread today and the smell was amazing. Oh, that's dope. I'm not the best at cooking, but I'm off the hook at cleaning. So, but that's awesome that you made bread. Like now I'm hungry. So thank you for that. <laughs> Anybody else? If not, I can I can definitely move on. I just always like to check in and get a temperature check and see how folks are feeling. I was having a challenge today, but I'm happy that I'm here. Awesome. Oh, challenge day, and then I went on a run for clarity. Oh, that's beautiful. I normally take my dogs for a walk. Um, I say I walk them, but I feel like they walk me, but it helps me get out of this like, oh, I have all these things to do mindset. And you're tired. It's been a long week, Kevin, but I'm happy I'm here. It right. It is never ending. I always feel like two days is enough for us to to rest. And then when I'm done doing academic work or work work, I still have to clean. I still have to do all these other things. So I'm like, where's the break? That's my tangent for today. <laughs> awesome. And if folks want to continue to just throw them to the chat, I can read through it later. I'm gonna move us on. And so an introduction, right? So who am I? And how did I come into this space? Like I mentioned before, I'm Sergio or Sergio. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm a hot mess. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, I'm figuring this panorama as much as you are, right? And trying to figure out what's the best thing for me? How am I nurturing myself? What are the most important things that I need to take, think about and you know, center in my life right now? And I also think a lot about how did I come into this space, right? How did I come into like, getting a doctorate, trying to go into the academic realm, doing work, really focusing on, on students who identify as queer and Latinx, right? 
And why does this matter to me? And so I think the best way to, to explain this to y'all is to dive, take you to the past, to my past, to take you to little baby Sergio. As you can see, I put a little arrow. That's me right there. I think I was about like four or five years old around there. And so just share a little about me. I'm from the Bay Area, born and raised. Um, the San Francisco Bay Area grew up in East Palo Alto and Redwood City, um, or EPA, as, as we call it back home. And so, like, like, um, I, like as the, um, Priscilla mentioned earlier, my mom's from, born and raised in California, and my dad comes from Mexico, right? He comes from the state of Jalisco. And my mom's side, they're from Michoacan, but my mom, my mom is first gen. And so I don't remember too much about this day, but what I do remember is, um, is that, well, A, I was feeling myself because I was like, look at me and like my suspenders and look at me and my bow tie and like, we're gonna go take a picture with Santa. So it was around like Christmas season, Christmas time. And my mom took us to go take this picture. And that's my sister next to me or to the other side of me, not next to me, that's Santa. And so I'm taking my picture. And what you can see in this picture is, um, which was like early nineties or like, yes, really early nineties. What you can't see in this picture is that I have a little colita or a little ponytail. And so during, like at this time or during this time, like Los Bukis and like Los Temerarios were like really popping in like Mexican pop culture music. And they had like a ponytail, like a, like a little mullet kind of ponytail. So I had that. My parents were about it. I had it. I was living for it. And I remember my mom, we take this picture and my mom was like, all right, I'm going to take you to your grandma's house, her mom's house, because I have to go over in errands and that's who's going to be your caretaker. So she takes us to my grandma's house and she leaves. Oops, sorry about that. And when she leaves, my grandma comes out of, of, of the kitchen or the, I don't know what room she was in. She comes out though, and she's really determined with a pair of scissors and she goes, Sergio, you're a boy, you should not have a colita and proceeds to cut it off, like just snip it. And the reason why this is important is because I think this was like the first time that I was trying to like understand or conceptualize like what is gender? What is it, what does it mean to be a man or present in a masculine way? Like, why can't I have my colita or like, why couldn't I even wear like the dress that like my sister has, for example, right? Like what's, what's I don't get it, you know, as much as I could, cause you know, I'm still, I'm like four years old. I'm not like, no crazy scholar at four years old with all these like, you know, words for my, my toolbox. I was like, I don't get it. I was having fun. I thought it was okay. What is the issue? And so as I like dived into like the work that I do, which is a lot of like hoteria pedagogy, and I'm going to explain that a lot later, but hoteria really quick is another term that you can use for queerness. It has a very negative connotation, but I'll break that down um, throughout um, our session today. And so and so I, I didn't understand, I was trying to like figure out, right? So this is like one of those first times and I think it's critical because this I think was that, was that moment in time or that spark that really started everything for me in terms of like questioning these things, understanding myself, right? How, how did I come to identify as a queer and Latinx person um, in these spaces at home with my family, et cetera. And so jumping into grad school, I think that was the first time I, I, I really came into reading about it in an academic setting. Because I've heard of Loteria on the street, I've heard of Loteria in other spaces, right? But I've never like heard it or read it in an academic kind of setting. And that's when everything like really changed for me because I was like, I feel seen, I feel validated, right? I don't have to use other terminology. I don't have to use queer theory, for example. And I'll get into why like I'm not the biggest fan of queer theory. Um, and not to be like, like, oh, it's not good, it, it is great. I think it de definitely helped push boundaries, right? In terms of like how folks are theorizing, how folks are working with students, but I think it's also really limited and also really white centric. So I prefer to use other ways of like knowing and building community and like make meaning of what we're doing in these spaces. So I wanted to share that because I think that's super important. And then, Histor some historical context. So what's Hispanic? What does it mean to be Chicana or Chicano, right? And so I, I always think, what do you think about when you hear the term Hispanic or like Chicana and Chicano, right? And so the first thing that comes to my mind is 
where did Hispanic come from, right? So the term Hispanic really like refers to like people, cultures, or countries related to Spain, um, right? So the term Hispano or Hispana, Hispanic, wasn't invented in the US, right? It's a Spanish word that means belonging or relating to Hispania, Spain, and then belonging or relating to Hispano America. So countries in the Americas where Spanish is spoken. So as you can see on this map that I put, for example, Brazil is not part of it, right? There, it's, it's not a Spanish speaking country. So for them, this is how in the Hispanic definition, it's not a Hispanic country. And so um, Hispanic really came in use in the US officially around, I wanna say the 1970s during Richard, Richard Nixon's presidency. And the reason was the US government decided to adopt this term as a universal term that could serve to include all Spanish speaking groups in the US, typically a person born or who descends from Spain is really referred to as Spanish or Spaniard, right? And it was also like used specifically for the census. And so that's where Hispanic came about in our context, right? And how it's used and you'll see a lot of like census data or, or any type of like data demographic like questionnaires where they're asking these kinds of things, right? So that's where Hispanic comes into play for us in the US. And so what is Chicana, Chicano and Chicana, right? And so the way I like to break that down is someone who is native of or descends from Mexico and who lives in the United States. So Chicana, Chicano is like a chosen identity of some Mexican Americans in the US. The term became widely used during the Chicano movement of the 1960s by many Mexican Americans to express a political stance, right? Founded on a pride shared in cultural, ethnic, and community identity. And so the term Chicano is, is something that's used interchangeably with a lot of folks who are Mexican American, although they have different meanings. So I wanna make that clear, like Hispanic does not mean Chicano, Chicana does not mean Hispanic per se, right? And then Chicano does not mean Mexican. And I say like, for example, I identify as Mexican or Mexican American, but I don't identify as Chicano. Like I've never identified as Chicano. And so that's just like, you know, how I identify. And so when we're thinking about like terminology, right? You think about Latino. So like, what do you think about when you hear Latino, right? And so with the continued debate over its use, what I want to do is offer some, some quick guides using terms like Latino, Latina, Latina, Latinx, right? And so Latino. So Latino is an umbrella term really describing people from Latin America or Latin American descent without taking gender into account. However, queer and trans folks in our communities pointed out that the Spanish language is gendered, therefore the term Latino excludes women and in many cases gendered non-binary folks. And as you can see in this map, Brazil's a part of it, right? And so these are all countries that are under this Latin American umbrella and would be, would be considered Latino people. And so another thing to think about is Latino really is implied, is implied masculine, right? So there's no need to say like Latino male or Latinx man, just say Latino for people that identify as Latin American and as male and Latina. So what do you think about when you hear Latina? And so I put this, I put Latina is implied feminine. There's no need to say Latina woman or Latinx woman. You can simply say Latina for people that identify as women in Latin American, right? And also it's important, like I mentioned earlier, right? The term Latina, Latino and Latina includes people from Brazil, but excludes those who were born or descended from Spain. So that's like that big distinction, right? Not all Brazilians identify themselves as Latino or Latina, but many do. And so for, because of that, Hispanic refers more to the language while Latino and Latina refers more to the culture. And now we get to Latinx and Latina. And it's like, what is Latinx? Or what do people think about when they hear Latinx, right? And so with the recent popularity of the term Latinx and its use in progressive politics, the term has become an all-encompassing descriptor that assumes that Latinx is a replacement for Latino, Latina, Latine, Chicana, Chicana, but it's not. Like it was never meant to be like, oh, here's the term that's going to trump every other term that you, you know, you've been thinking about. It's also important to note that queer and trans communities created the term Latinx in the US and Latine in Latin America to include their experiences as people of this community living on its margins without visibility because of a gender oppressive and stubborn language. That's just the reality. Because the language is gendered, it's like, where are, how are folks being, you know, how are folks visible, right? 
How are folks being seen? How can folks relate? They can't. And so that's where Latinx and Latina really popped up. And like, and like most things that go mainstream, people made it their own, right? And use it as a replacement, like I mentioned earlier, for Latina and Latino, which really adds to this apprehension of its use by members of, of our communities a lot of times. So people are really feeling and have felt like they were being told how to identify and didn't understand its context. So what's the big mix up? The big deal, right? So the mix up. Latinx and Latina implies everyone, including queer, trans, and gender non-binary folks. But everyone does not identify as Latinx. So examples are a trans woman may identify as trans Latina or Latina, and the same goes for a trans man. They could identify as trans Latino or just Latino. And gender non-binary folks may identify as both genders, no gender, or that are gender fluid, may likely identify as Latinx because they don't see themselves in gendered Spanish. And it's also important to note that Latinx is very much US context, right? It's created for folks in this space, used in this space. And so when you go outside of the US, obviously like people don't fuck around saying, hola, soy Latinx, right? <laughs> it doesn't have the same kind of connection. And that's why I say context is super important, understanding like, why did the language come up? Like the word, you know, the wording language, why has it evolved in such a way? Because context is super, super, super important. And let me continue. Oh, let me go back. And so we say, we say Latinx not because Latino or Latina is no longer valid, but because the term is inclusive of all people in our communities, right? There are a bunch of other like nuances, complexities, and how folks really identify or don't with these terms based on their experiences, both geographically and ethnically. But this is like the gist of it. I just wanted to give you so that we're all on the same page, right? The point is that Latina, Latino, Latinx, Latina can coexist if you just know how to use the terms and when. And so how does this connect back to like the work that I'm doing, right? So as I was trying to figure out like, how am I gonna dive into like this Joteria work and research and pedagogy in my own way? So currently I am in a PhD program in higher education and student affairs. But like I told you, when I started grad school in my master's program, that's when I started learning about like Joteria and how people were using it as a theory. And I was like, what? That's not real. That's fake. That's stuff I've heard out in the street with some friends. And but it was right there. And so like one of the first things I ever read was by Dr. Anita Tijerina Revilla and uh, Meño eh, Jose Manuel. I call him Meño Santiana because that's like, that's Meño's name. Um, and they wrote Jotere Identity and Consciousness, which I'm gonna break down in a little bit. But what do you think about when you hear Jotere? Well, the term joteria really derives from the colloquial Spanish language term, right? Joto, meaning sissy, maricon, referring to gay men in Mexico and Mexican and Chicanx communities in the US, right? And it's important to know like, where did, where did like joto and joteria come from? So a little side story in the 19, I wanna say forties or fifties, don't quote me on the time because I always forget numbers. Um, during this time in Mexico City in the prison system, they were trying to find ways to categorize folks and put them in specific like cell blocks. And so for folks who identified as queer, trans, they put them in cell block J. And then the term Joto and Joteria emerged. And from that, it was like, oh, okay, this is gonna be the derogatory term we're gonna use to describe folks that are queer. And from there, it's you know, spread like wildfire through Mexico, and I'm sure in other parts of Latin America, and then it merged up into US context. And so that's like it, its origins, right? But as time evolved, like with anything, terms evolve, we evolve in, in, in the sense of what kind of language are we using and why, right? And so Joteria started to really take on its own definition. You start to see a lot of people in activist settings and you know, in community settings, take Joteria and reclaim it. And they were like, I'm taking this term and I'm, it's a way for me to say, I love you, right? Andamos joteando, or like, andamos en la joteria. And using it as a way to build bonds, to come together, to be like, we're in community. And then from there, you started seeing folks coming up in academic circles that were parts of, part of these communities 
they were like, let's theorize around it. Why can't we like talk about and center ourselves in these spaces instead of using a lot of traditional social science research, white logic, right? And with that, the term evolved. And one of the latest like definitions that I, that I think really breaks this down is the following. So Joteria is a politic of social transformation simultaneously rooted in resistance against oppression and Jotec slash queer triumph, joy and healing. And that's by, um, that's by the same prophet, Dr. Revia et al. And that was just published in 2021. And the reason why like, I put an asterisk next to this is because I had the opportunity to be a part of this. So I am very grateful because um, Anita, Dr. Revia, reached out to me and said, hey, would you want to like co-create with me and some of my colegas on this chapter where we're talking about Joteria and Mujerista love in the classroom and what that looks like in terms of fear raising. And I was like, hell yeah, I want to be a part of that. Like, this is the work I want to do. Like, I want to like dive into it because I have a lot of thoughts and, you know, I'm in this space as well. Like I identify with Joteria in so many ways. And so I was able to be a part of this project to come up with like, or to continue to evolve this definition of Joteria, how we see it and what it looks like in a lot of these academic spaces, right? And with that, Joteria identity and consciousness. So during, during my time here at, um, at Claremont Graduate University, I was trying to, oh, I see a chat, sorry. Thank you. Um, during my time here at Claremont Graduate University, I was trying to figure out what, what am I gonna do for my dissertation? I need to like, like I need support. And so I reached out to a, my colleague and I reached out to a profe that we had taken, Dr. Jose Ochoa at Pomona College. And we were like, is there any way that we could like do a pilot, like do a, an independent study course with you? Because we both want to do pilot studies on what we think we want to do for our dissertation. And uh, Jilda, Dr. Ochoa, was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's, um, let's create a course and it'll be your, it'll be your, independent study, but this will be where you get to implement a whole pilot study, go through the whole process, and then bring it all together. And so what I did was I used this time to create what is now my dissertation, right? And so as you can see on the right-hand side, um, I started this project called Hotel Identity and Consciousness, Platicas of Co-Creation with Undergraduate Queer Latinx Students. And so in this time, I got to dive into Hotel Identity and Consciousness, which is the name of, of the theorizing and the work that Anita and Menyo put together. And I put, like, what is, what is Hotel Identity and Consciousness? How does it, like, connect to, like, the work that we're doing, right? And so it really comes down to the characteristics of this kind of theorizing. And so some of the characteristics include being rooted in fun, um, laughter, and radical queer love. It's derived from the terms Jota, Joto, Jotec, and has been reclaimed as an identity slash consciousness of empowerment, as I mentioned earlier, right? And it's based on queer, Latinx, Latina, Latino, and Chicanx, Chicana, Chicano, and gender non-conforming realities or lived experiences. So for me, I was like, this is what I need to use to do the work that I'm doing, because this is centering people where they're at and not institutions, right? A lot of times we read things from, um, from this lens of, well, you need to like make sure that uh, you're like centering like old research, right? Or I call it white logic. And I was like, you can't really do that in communities of color. And then when we like really go into these margins, as I mentioned earlier, you can't really bring like white logic, like queer theory. And let's, let's, let's use this theoretical framework and see what we can come up with, with folks who are queer and Latinx, because it's not connected to them, if that makes sense. And so for me, I was like, Joteria Identity and Consciousness as this framework to guide my qualitative work is going to be the best way to go about it, because it's centering people where they are, and the heart, from the messiness, from the pain, from the joy, right, from the kinship, as some would say. And so this is why I included it. So as the project was going, so basically, to give you like a rundown, um, I had platicas as opposed to interviews, and I'll break down platicas right now. So I had platicas with about 12 undergraduate um, students who identified as queer and Latinx and were specifically at predominantly white institutions. Now, I did that because I'm at a predominantly white institution, so because Claremont Graduate University is literally right next to five liberal arts colleges, I was like, oh, this would be great 
because now I can just connect to these institutions and connect with folks and engage in these, you know, powerful platicas. Well, this happened in the spring. I want to say the spring of 2020, like literally, literally right when the, the panorama came through. And it was like, what are we like, what am I going to do? I can't have these platicas, right? And so everything had to go virtual. And so next thing I know, I put like a, like a flyer out, an email blast, and people started hitting me up from around the country. So my platicas consists of folks around the country that are like, I want to engage in this because I don't, I've never seen some kind of work that, that is centering me and not centering like institutions or like white queer knowledge that a lot of time really takes over in the academic world and work. And so that's how this came about. And with that, these are some themes that emerged from like the work that we're doing. And the image that I showed before, which is here as well, um, is actually the image that we put on this brief that I ended up publishing. So I ended up publishing this, it was open access and I was intentional about that because I said, I don't wanna do work that is gonna have a paywall where nobody has access to it. Because what's gonna happen, then it's gonna sit in this, what I like to call the ivory tower and it's gonna collect dust. So for me, I wanna do work that's gonna be accessible to the communities I'm working with and engaging with, and I'm a part of, right? Like there has to be meaning to that. And so with this, with this project, this research, um, these were the, like some of the main themes that came, there were a bunch of themes, right? But I had to like, be, like let me condense this, let me bring this together. And ultimately, these were like the, the big three overarching themes that I found. And the first one was, do I belong? A lot of the platicas I engaged with, with um, the undergrad students, they were like, I don't know if I belong in this space. I don't know if I wanna belong in this space. I see a lot of the hurt and the pain that other folks in my community and my children, family go through. And I don't know if I wanna be a part of it. And so there was a lot of questioning, like, I don't know if I belong in these institutions. And so I can't tell you that like, I'm a part of this community. Right? They found little pockets here and there, but not necessarily like my institution makes me feel like I'm a part of this. And then radical queer love. And why, and so for me, I was the way people were engaging with each other, with me, the way um, I was engaging with them through this platica methodological approach was awesome because we were like coming from the heart. And yes, there's a lot of like you need to be objective in how you do research, et cetera. But I also firmly believe that research is not objective. In a lot of ways, it's like you're coming in with your biases, with your compassion, with who you are. And through Platicas, I was able to like laugh with folks. I was able to acknowledge what they were going through and just be and just coexist, right? And so Radical Queer Love was something that came about. And for me, Radical Queer Love in this work showed up in microaffirmations. Now, what, are, what the hell are microaffirmations, right? So I got the best definition right here for y'all. So the everyday forms of affirmation and validation, POC engage with each other in a variety of public and private settings. Those nods, smiles, embraces, use of language, et cetera, right? All that really express, that express acknowledgement and affirm self-worth. And that's by Dr. Daniel Solorzano at UCLA. And I believe it's, um, I am blinking out on the name. It's like, there's three authors. Um, Dr. Lindsay Perez Uber, and I think Dr. Uber's child as well engaged into like creating, co-creating this article that's like super powerful. So if you get a chance, read it. And so the reason why I chose micro, micro affirmations through this radical queer love was because through like no intention of my own, I realized we were creating space to acknowledge each other and just feel seen. The, the panorama had just started. Like people were like, I'm confused, I don't know what to do. And so when folks were meet, when we were meeting to dive into like, hey, these are our platicas, it was a way to be like, hey, I'm with you. Like, I remember feeling the exact same thing when I was in undergrad or like, is there anything I can do to help you? Or like being told, thank you so much for doing this. Like you're making me feel like so validated in this space, right? Or just acknowledging me, my pronouns, the way I, I choose to identify as opposed to making assumptions on like my character, like my, I, you know, gender identity makeup and stuff. And so for me, like, this is super powerful and this is what's happening. And so I wanna make sure I'm sharing that because a lot of times 
we think about a lot of this work and it comes from a deficit-based perspective, right? What do I mean by deficit-based? Like, let's look at the negative, which there's a lot of negatives. I'm not gonna lie. Like if I go into the data and like all of the platica information, there's a lot of like bad stuff that was going on and like negative things coming about. And so I was like, yes, that does exist. And look at this beautiful aspect, right? Of what's coming about. And so I wanted to also hone in on that aspect because I'm like, I want to read stuff where there's like coteria joy, like, you know, queer love, like folks, you know, supporting each other and finding ways to build community. So the third theme that really stuck out was this notion of a critical consciousness and hoteria identity, right? And I wrote here that a state of critical consciousness, understanding of self and emergence of hoteria identity, where folks were like, yeah, I'm a hot mess, but I love myself in this way. And I'm so happy that like, I can see that, whereas I could not see it before. Or, wow, because of this platica, I've learned so much about myself. You made me feel like I was in a therapy session. Was that your intention, right? And I was like, no, not at all. I just, I wanted to engage and I wanted to actively listen and be here with you while we get on this ride. What I call a roller coaster of a ride, right? Because everyone has a different journey. Everyone has a different way of coming together. And so I share this with you because I think it's important to like, as we think about like terminology and words that we're using, we need to think about, well, where are people at, right? Like how do folks identify? Why can't we just ask them, what do you prefer or what works for you? Like with pronouns, what are your pronouns? As opposed to like, let me make the assumption because you may be male presenting, et cetera, right? And so it was hard for me because I, you know, we have to think too, like in my case, like we're conditioned, I'm conditioned to think of things in a certain way, like even how we conduct research, how we act in, in class, how we act in a lot of these, you know, academic and professional settings. And it's always like categorize things, categorize people, categorize identities, but nobody's asking. And so with, with this work, I was just like, well, what works for you? What does it look like for you? And everybody had something beautiful and unique and different. I was like, that's dope. And so for me, Hoteria really clicked in in that way because it was like, you have agency over what you're saying. It's not me saying, well, you know, person A feels this and that's that. No, not at all. It was like, hey, this is what you said. What do you think? As I went through my process, right? What do you think? Does that work for you? I want to make sure I'm not misinterpreting what you wanted to convey to me in our platicas. So with that, I want to leave y'all with this really dope and powerful quote that um, I'll put the link for, for this article. Um, but something to think about when we're thinking about like Latinx, Latina, and how folks identify, right? So it's important for us to not normalize Latinx, but to engage in critical reflection of how violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, asexual, so LGBTQIA+, Latin Americans has been accepted by Latin American people to the point that LGBTQIA plus Latinxes have had to create a linguistic intervention in the hopes that they can live a livable life. So I just want you to like sit with that, take a moment to process, what does that mean, right? And with that, I wanna open it up to questions. I'm going to stop sharing. Sergio, thank you so much for your presentation. So informative. No <laughs> um, so I'm sure a lot of people are probably wondering right now, you know, there's a lot of terms. There's a lot of yeah. things for me to be aware of. Um, what would you say, you know, you what would you recommend to people who kind of want to learn more about this history or just maybe getting started um, but want to learn a bit more? Yeah, I mean, so there's um, I I've written I've written stuff, co-written stuff, right, co-authored stuff in the academic world, but there's also like all these other spaces and places where you can like dive into this because I don't believe that creating knowledge, right, or co-creating just comes from the ivory towers I like to call it, right, or academia. I love to call it academia because I'm always like this is really problematic. And this is how academia treats a lot of folks of color. And then when you think about the intersections of identities, it gets worse. So go to Google, go to IG, go to you, go to TikTok. TikTok is one of my favorite platforms right now because it teaches you so much in like a minute or less. 
type in terms, right? Like hashtag Hoteria and like see what pops up for you, right? Um, listen to podcasts where they're centering these like folks where they're at and this knowledge. So um, at the end, or I can do it right now before I forget, I have, a, I have like this little link tree where like a projects that I've done. And so that's like articles that I've written um, or co-written stuff that I've done in like media, right? Where like I've been on presentations or podcasts and stuff and um, yeah, like to listen in, to watch, et cetera. And hopefully that can like help engage folks. And, and always remember too, in this kind of work because it's community-based, it's all about like honoring the folks that were before you. That's why I was big on like, hey, like, you know, Dr. Revia talked about this and showed this for me, right? Or like, man, you'll correct this. Or they co-created this beautiful theory to like center people where they're at, right? Because it's always the ancestors and the folks before us that really paved these spaces and places for us to be like hella rebelde and be like, this is where I'm at today. This is what I'm doing. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. I agree. There's so much knowledge out there, right? I think sometimes people feel overwhelmed a little bit, right? So I'm glad you have some resources that people can kind of point to. Um, you do talk a lot about your own educational journey and even on your social media. I'm, I'm just curious, you know, what was it like for you to navigate your own undergraduate journey and kind of learning about your own identity? And what, what does that look like now that, you know, you're years later in a PhD program? That's a loaded question. Let me say. So I think for you me, know, whatever you're willing to share, of course. I'm an I'm an open book because I think <laughs> I look at it as like if if we don't share, like you know, a lot of times we don't know, right? And so I think for me, like my undergrad. So I'm from you know, born and raised in California. I um, I took like a big leap, and I ended up going to school in New York to a really small liberal arts college, so Manhattanville College. And the reason why I went there was because you know. I came from the hood. I wasn't getting along with my parents. I was always like getting into trouble. And I was like, I need to like separate myself from my family unit and like, like learn who the hell I am. Because it was always like Sergio and like, you know, all these other things. And yes, as much as I believe in like, you know, come together as a family, be as a unit, you also need to find out who you are in order to be able to be the best you for your family, for your, you know, your community, et cetera. So I think me leaving California and going to school in New York was like a whole different world and like learning that there are so many other people aside from Mexican people, right? Like a lot of times it's very Mexican centric in terms of like what we learn, how we learn about things, right? And so for me, like taking, taking courses on like Latin American, Latin American studies had nothing to do with Mexican culture. And I came from a state where it was like, oh, everybody's Mexican. So this is what we're learning in all of our classes, right? So it was like, I think a good reality check in terms of like, understand the nuances of like how identity intersects and how it's really different, right? Just because we come from Latin America doesn't mean that like, it's all the same, right? And even terms like Joto and Joteria, like I would say things over there in New York and they were like, what is that? That's not a term that we use. That's not how we connect. That's not like a social indicator in any way, shape or form, right? So like understanding like even the language that we have to like bond is different and how do we come together? So for me, I think I was like coming into my critical consciousness without knowing it. And then later when I started, after I graduated working with students and then coming back into my grad journey, that's when it started to really click. Like, what are we doing to like suppress this, these intersections, right? And how are we perpetuating these like stigmas and notions of like, we have to be a certain way to be successful and only show certain aspects of ourselves. What does it mean to be my whole self and be a hot mess in a professional conference? What does that mean? Am I not gonna get a job now? Does that mean that like the way I theorize and I wanna come together and like build with people is not rigorous, right? So it's a lot of like undoing the ways that we're taught to socialize or normalize behavior. Yeah, and you bring up a good point about how there's so many norms, right? And how norms, you know, are are even being broken just by you being who you identify, right? Um, I'm curious on your perspective, you know, with, you know, even some of the terms you may use, people may think like, oh, like that seems like a lot, right? Because, you know, Joto does come from a very uh, specific history, right? So I'm curious, what has been your experience with, you know, people maybe pushing back against, you know, some of some of what you speak about since it is something that other people can be problematic compared to, you know, some other people in the community, right? It can be different depending on what part of the community you come from. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So I'll tell you this. Um, 
I don't deal with a lot of a lot of pushback as much anymore, but I think that's because I've published, and so like now there's this like messed up notion of like, oh, okay, it's validated because it's published in a, you know from an academic journal or what have you, right? Um, but I, I remember when like I really wanted to dive into this, and not in my master's program, but more like when I started my PhD. I remember people telling me like coteria is not something you ever want to use. No one's ever going to read this kind of research. This is never going to go anywhere. You're wasting your time. And so it was very like people were shutting me down. And I was like, this is just not the right home for this kind of work. Like I had to learn to not take it personal because it was a lot of like, this isn't rigorous. And even with um, this report that got published last year. Yeah, last year, I want to say February 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like somebody like, so here's like a really messed up story. Somebody emailed the dean of my department at my current institution and was like, I don't know who this person is. I just saw like a snippet of the email. So I took a screenshot of it. So I was like, I need to have my own receipts and records because I need to see what this person said. But basically this person said that how embarrassing for CGU, Claremont Graduate University to um, allow this to be published because this is like so embarrassing. There's no rigor. This is not research that's validated. Like, how dare you, blah, 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 blah. And so the dean was like, I need to have like a quick meeting with you and your advisor. And so long story short, we, we meet. And I really went in with, I don't have high expectations for my dean in terms of like actual support, but my dissertation chair advisor is like the bomb.com and very much supportive and like, you know, I got you, we're, you do what you need to do. And so we go in there and the Dean is like, I, I want to support you. And so you could have done X, Y, and Z in your, in your published report to make sure that it addressed X, Y, and Z. And in my head, I was like, you didn't read it because I clearly addressed that this was, this was a pilot study conducted to inform my dissertation, that this work was meant to center folks where they're at and not institutions. And even like the jargon, like I can use academic jargon all day, but that's not, that wasn't the point of creating this piece. That was the point of engaging in comunidad, right? And in joteria, it was to center folks where they're at. And I, I specifically was like, I need to make sure that wherever this goes, it's open access and they won't change the voice. Because the, the agency that I was telling my co-creators, right? Like, I don't want that to be lost. So she, like, to me, I was like, the dean really like just, it went over their head. And that's when my advisor came in and said, I don't know who wrote this, but whoever wrote this email sounds like they're upset and they have a personal problem. I've read Sergio's work, Sergio is doing great. And this is like the beginning of like other things that he's doing. And so I don't see why we're having this conversation because in no way, shape or form did this like do anything negative. If anything, it's really bringing insightful, blah, blah, blah. So I was just like, this is, this is not my battle. And I need to not take this person. And I just let the dean know, thank you so much for your feedback. Um, if this is how people are reacting to this pilot study, I can only imagine how people are going to react to my dissertation when it's published. But that's a reality. Like people aren't always like too like accepting of this kind of work. And so you just gotta, you gotta pick and choose your battles. I'm gonna say that. Yeah, it seems like um, what you speak about or what you even live, right? within your own identity and how you speak about your experience about being part of the queer community and the Latinx community runs very counter narrative to, you know, what people would say like, this is the right way to be queer. This is the right way to be Latinx, right? right. So my question would be, how do you kind of maintain so much strength or perseverance in your ideals and your morals, despite, you know, incidents like those or other kind of incidents where you know people are kind of causing a little bit of maybe conflict how do you kind of persevere maybe stay strong within your own morals or your beliefs um, really yeah so that's a good question so therapy <laughs> if you have access to therapy please use therapy you don't know how like life-changing that could be like you're literally in a session with someone however like for an hour however long you meet and it's just about you like that's the best time for you to be like, I'm going to be selfish. This is about me. So we're going to talk about me and my feelings and process, right? Um, growing up, like I used to, this is how I explain it. I used to bottle things up until like my bottle filled up and then it would like explode. And it was like a random person would make a random comment. And that was like, whoop, what made like me explode. 
And so in like in therapy and in like other ways of building community, because not everyone has access to therapy. There's a lot of privilege, right, to being able to go to therapy. Um, and even in like my home, like in my family, like when I would mention therapy when I was younger, it was like, why are you going to therapy? No, that's local. Like that's always the connection. Like you go to a therapist, that's local. And it's like, no, it's for your, your mental health, for your well-being, right? It's for you to nurture and process. So like, so therapy or be in a space with community that can understand and like nurture, right? And so for example, like Dr. Revia is actually one of my committee members for my dissertation. And so in my committee, she's one of, she's one of four, but she's definitely one of the people that I can text and say, I feel like a hot mess, Anita. Like, can we have a moment to talk? Because this is how I feel about this research or like the things that happened, you know, at my institution, blah, blah, blah. And so that's where like, like building connections with folks that A, have the time and capacity, right? To like listen, to, to hear you. So one thing I like to do, and I, I do this a lot with like my friends, my family, my chosen fam, I say, do you have capacity for my word vomit for me to like unpack what like I'm going through? Because we're all going through it, especially right now, right? Like, and academia is really good about like business as usual, go to class, go to work, let's pretend like we don't have these issues going on or like we lost a family member or like things are happening or someone's in the hospital or like x y and z and so always ask do you have time and capacity to have this conversation with me that's definitely a good way to think about it too right like not only are you going through something but other people are too and do they have the room to kind of be there for you in that capacity so i think that's a really good point you make um, as we mentioned earlier, you know, our theme for Latinx Heritage this month is celebrating our diverse stories, voices, and identities. How do you kind of see that within the Latinx community, within the queer community, within the intersections of both? So I feel like, especially with like this younger generation, like I, I live for what I see on social media where people are like, I don't care about gender. I don't care about like sticking to these like traditional notions and like even the idea of machismo, right? Like a lot of younger folks are like, live your life. You want to like gender bend, do it. You want to wear this and mix it up with that, go for it. And so I think for me, like I love seeing that and I love always like honoring and like mentioning that or like breaking that down and like when I'm in spaces like presenting and stuff and being like, do you see what these folks are doing like on TikTok? That's beautiful. Look like look how they're creating like their own form of knowledge, right? Look how they're creating like blurring these lines and really diving into the intersections of like, I'm going to be queer and I'm going to be Latinx at the same time in its full capacity and not have to choose one over the other. So like for me, and that's why I said at the beginning, I don't believe in this idea or this hierarchy of pro, I'm the profe, you're the student, I'm the, I'm the researcher, you're the participant. And so I was like, how are we learning from each other? What are you bringing to the table? And what am I bringing to the table? Oh, that's awesome. I'm here to learn, right? And I think that's hard in academia because a lot of profs, I don't know if y'all have ever had profs that are very like, this is how it is. This is my syllabus. And it's been like this for 20 years. And you're like, first of all, ain't nobody use Blackboard anymore. So you need to change your syllabus. And then second of all, it's like, have you updated who you're citing? There's so many people in so many different ways to like, you know, bring knowledge. That's why I said like, you can cite TikTok. You can cite Twitter, you can cite Instagram and bring it into these spaces because all these intersecting like nuances are like super powerful and they inform a lot of the research that's popping off right now. Yeah, and I think that really speaks to how you talk about how knowledge is just constructed in one way and one, one vision of knowledge is valued over others, right? And how important it is to kind of consider that there can be other versions of knowledge that aren't just in academia, right? How even within the Latinx community, you talked about platicas, right? So conversations that happen between people um, that can also be the knowledge because many people in the community have passed down information or stories through platicas, right? Um, so I just want to take a minute to thank you so much, Sergio, for being so open and for sharing all this wonderful information. Um, my last question would, to you would be if there's one thing you want people to take away from your presentation or, you know, your experience or just in general, um, what would you want people to take away? Um, I would say, you know, like center yourself and your priorities, right? Even in your, even in, in your research, like people say that we need to, well, I've been told you need to be objective. And I'm always like, the person was political at this point. 
if I'm not willing to like, you know, step up and like center like my dissertation, for example, centering queer Latinx folks, their voices and using frameworks and, you know, methodological approaches that center folks of color, then like I'm doing a disservice to them and myself, right? And so there's way more research out there beyond what we're told, reach out to people. I always say like, I'm that person that will hit up people and ask questions. I'm very like Osikona, so I will go and ask a question or a lot of questions. You never know who's gonna respond. So I always say, hit them up. Like, you know, like you never know if someone's gonna like, maybe they can't respond that day, but they'll respond in a few weeks, right? And so like, think about like, how am I centering myself and what I'm doing and, and how does it, how, how does it like, how do I make meaning of this? Or, and how does it matter to me? Because whenever we personalize something, it's that much better as opposed to like, oh, I have to do this for an assignment. Awesome. And with that, thank you so much, Sergio, for being here and giving us some of your time and attention. Um, for all our attendees, please make sure to fill out the survey posted in the chat. Um, Sergio, once again, muchas gracias. Um, I'm sure people <laughs> will find you on social media um, if you want to post your information on there. Um, yeah, so in the, in the link that I sent, it has all of that, like my social media, like LinkedIn, email. If you have questions and you want to have a, a platica about this, please email me and I will respond. Might be a little late, but I will respond and we'll find some time to like chat. That's right. Taking, you know, placing those boundaries, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sergio. We appreciate you being here tonight. And with that, I'm going to close out the night by playing some music. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good Thank night. You. Thank you. So much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.